Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Raise the Vibe with Liz. I'm your host, Liz Peterson, and today I have Ainsley McLeod joining me from Fashion Island. Ainsley is an internationally acclaimed past life psychic, spiritual teacher, and award-winning author of The Instruction, The Transformation, and most recently, The Old Souls Guidebook. Ainsley specializes in exploring past lives to reveal your life's purpose, and has been a featured guest on Oprah's Super Soul Conversation series. Ainsley, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Liz. It's good to be back. Great to have you. So I was talking before the show with you and asking you about how we should start it. And I was really drawn to ask you, what are you doing now? So instead of asking what it was, your journey that led you to now, let's start with that. So Ainsley, what are you working on right what now? What am I working on right now? Yes. Well, you know, as, as you know, we have this membership program, mm -hmm. um, Soul World. And, uh, you know, shameless plug here, but if you go to Soul World, I can't even say it, soulworld.com. <laughs> that's where you can learn about our membership program. Um, part of this is that we, we choose a theme. Well, I work with uh, Spirit Guides, so they choose a theme uh, every month. And then we explore the heck out of that. Uh, we we have classes, uh, Q and A's, regressions, comments from the spirit guides, um, very interactive forum, and so on going on. Now, uh, what we're working on this month is really understanding what it means to be an empath, and uh, the people that I work with, my clients, I I think almost to a person, they're they're empaths. They they're you know what we'd call highly sensitive people. Uh, well, I know you're, you're one yourself, you know, and a lot of people who are out there doing, doing healing kind of work, um, channeling energy, energy through their bodies, whether it's intuitive stuff or it's, it's healing through the, the hands, uh, whatever it is, it's, it's the high degree of sensitivity that really allows you to be uh, incredibly effective at doing that. So I have all these clients, all these people I've been working with over the years, and I've noticed a theme, and one is that not only are they extremely empathic, but almost every single one has drawn a narcissist in or a bully of some kind, um, because bullies are drawn to empaths, and unfortunately, empaths are drawn to bullies. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's this strange little dance this sort of thing that we do. And it's such a common thing that I wanted to create a program and the, this, this month's exploration about what it means to be an empath is really leading to a further exploration about then looking at the signs of, you know, what's it like to be in a relationship with a narcissist or of a narcissistic parent or narcissistic child or, or whatever, or narcissistic friends or, you know, narcissistic president. You know, so we're all dealing with the, the effects of, or so many uh, empaths are dealing with the effects of narcissists, whether it's on sort of global level or just, you know, the person in the next room. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, there's a, like a, there's a real need at this time, you know, like, I mean, certainly the, the connection between narcissists and empaths, it's, it's sort of well recognized and there's plenty of literature out there. What I'm doing is I'm looking at it more from the, spiritual point of view and you know why are we drawn to a certain kind of people and you know what are the triggers and why do why do bullies do the things kind of things that they do how do they get away with it and why do empaths so often let them and you know allow themselves to be perhaps victimized or, or bullied so that in a nutshell is what i'm working on right right now can we break that down a little bit? Why is the empath sure. attracted to the narcissist or the person on the spectrum? Well, uh, I think partly, partly the problem is that empaths, they, 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 they're idealists as well, you know? So, and, and in a good way, you know, the spirit world will say that we need more empaths. Uh, sorry, uh, you know, we need, we need more uh, compassionate, intuitive, you know, healer, uh, idealists, you know, the, the people who see the potential in others and want to see a better world and so on. It's, I mean, it's a good thing. I mean, of course, there's a, there can be a Pollyannish kind of version of that. 
uh, which is sort of unrealistic. But I think a lot of times we think of that idealism as being yeah, somehow unrealistic. But in fact, the world needs that sort of thing, more healers, more idealists, and so on, uh, really to, to, cre to visualize improvement and, and help really to create that. So um, unfortunately, what you'll get with, with so many empathic old, older souls is that they'll see the potential in somebody else. In fact, this is something I've come across an awful lot, where an empath gets blindsided by having been involved with somebody who's really taken advantage of them, like a sociopath or something. And they, they, they wonder, why the heck did I not see it? You know, like afterwards, you know, the dust is starting to clear. It's like, Phew. You know, how come I couldn't see that? But there's a real kind of blind spot for, for the idealistic empath. You're seeing the soul beneath the surface. You're seeing the good in somebody. And sometimes you miss the warning signs that another person sees like, well, it's obvious. How could you trust this person? But the empath is kind of going, oh, but they're such a good soul. And, you know, you know they're seeing all the, 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 those good qualities and being blinded too. Sometimes it's like the blinders are on. They're just not seeing the whole picture. So uh, that's very appealing to narcissists and bullies. You know, it's like you can kind of understand the dynamic. It's like the cop and the robber, you know, some, you know, kind of one needs the other. And uh, except they don't, you know, ideally, ideally the, you know, it's unfortunate, like I say, there's always that att attraction. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you're a very empathic soul, um, it is so easy to get into that slip into that relationship, ignore the warning signs. And this is the typical thing, so, but the signs are all there. Right. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, um, I talk about this in my new book where I'll be working with somebody and my spirit guides talk to me in shorthand. It's, you know, we've, we've been working together for 20 years. So they don't have to give me 2000 words if two words will, will work. So there's certain little phrases or words that they will throw out there and so i'll be working with somebody my spirit guides will say say to me maya and that's short for maya angelou and it's short for maya angelou's quote about when people show you who they are believe them and and believe them the first time i believe it's the the whole thing um and that's and and i swear every time i'll say to my client well in, in the early days of your relationship with your now extremely dysfunctional husband or whoever it is, did you see some signs? And they go, oh, yeah. And I go, did you uh, ignore the signs? Oh, yeah, of course. You know, one of my clients talked about she was breaking up after five years with this guy who had uh, severe anger issues and uh, a drink problem. And uh, I, I said, well, you know, it must be something you saw in the early days. And she said, yeah, but, you know, first date, yeah, we met for an hour. We sank two bottles of wine. Actually, he drank most of it. And then she saw us later on, like some little flare up, you know, could have been, I can't, I can't remember, but getting angry with a waitress or something. And uh, all the signs were there. Um, but unfortunately, when you have that high, higher level of idealism and that, you know, big, big open heart chakra that comes with being an empath. It's like, well, you make excuses or you, you gloss over it. Well, he probably had a bad day at the office or, you know, he was just nervous because it was our first date or, or whatever. Um, and you'll find that with empaths as they go forward in relationships or coming from a, a family, a dysfunctional family, making excuses, covering up, you know, um, cleaning up the mess so nobody else notices and uh mm -hmm. it keeping up appearances right yeah. and they tend to feel like home you know yeah, you loving and charming and kind and giving and you're like oh i deserve this person in my life you know so you mm -hmm. ignore those warning signs you know the temper or you know the um expressions of anger you know, that are right. coming in or something like that. And you kind of blow it off because of the love bombing that's going on. You know, plus, as you yeah. were saying, you're coming from a family where that probably existed. So you're used yeah. to, you know, micromanaging that, you know, possibly from your parents. So it can feel like home. Sure. Oh, my God. It's, it's the familiarity. It's, you know, it's what, what you know. Um, 
And this is where I, I mean, I, something I hate is the, the sort of victim blaming that you get here, because what you usually find is that if somebody, if somebody is an empath and they're, they're in a relationship with a bully, it's not the first time. And maybe it's the, the father, maybe earliest or earlier relationships, but there's usually a theme. And then it's very easy for other people to go, oh yeah, well, like, oh, you know, so you, you manage to find another narcissist, you know, what's, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. Well, it's nothing wrong. It's just, it's a, it's a pattern. We all, we all fall into patterns. I mean, there's no question about that. But there's also, you know, you touched on one of the things that is a, that empaths are suckers for this. And this is love bombing. You know, and it, the, the, uh, the bully comes into the relationship and they come on super strong. And, uh, and instead of the, the empath going, hmm, maybe I should step back a little bit here. Is this, is this normal? They, they go, oh my God, this is wonderful. This, I must have met my soulmate here. You know, they want to bonk three times a, an hour. <laughs> it was like a, a, a huge, you know, great sex and, you know, all this, you know, the Valentine's cards and flowers at the door and stuff like that. And it, it's very, very kind of, um, you know, a, a, alluring. I mean, it, 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 you know, there's the empath craving love and um, not necessarily recognizing when something is actually not not so much love but more like a could be control or something like that so yeah the love bombing is like uh this is uh you know where the it's, it's, it's certainly in the, in the narcissist world you know they talk about love bombing with you know it's a very very common thing and uh yeah you get suckered you know it's like oh you think this is wonderful I, you know gosh you know i'm such a a lucky person to have, you know, to have this, but it's, it's just a way to, to lure you in. It's funny. Um, you find yourself questioning, is this for real? Yeah. Yeah. I remember yeah. doing that, you know, questioning it, but then kind of like, Oh no, it's just that I'm not used to this. I've right. Never this before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yet so often it's like, well, oh, here uh, after a while it's here we go again. It's like the mm -hmm. same old thing. You know? Yeah. So you mentioned your guides. How do your guides relate this to past life experiences and how do our experiences from our past lives, you know, kind of play into this? Well, this is what I find uh, so fascinating because, um, you know, my take on it, you know, how, how I view the whole thing is obviously, you know, from a, a more spiritual perspective and looking at, uh, you know, why, why do souls do this? Um, and particularly, why do em empaths, why are they like flames to these bullying moths? Um, so, uh, oh my gosh, where do I begin? What was the, what was the question again? Where do, uh, so many thoughts going oh, on. Oh, what to your um, guide, oh, yeah, the, say, you know, about the relationship between like uh, past life trauma and, you yeah. know, well, that's where I think it's like the, the yeah, the, the, um, the connection between what's happening now in past lives is, uh, it's super strong. People wouldn't normally recognize that that's uh, what it is. But you come into this world with, with certain wounds that are, are um, the result of past life trauma. In fact, a lot of present life trauma is healed by going back to a past life. Because if you shift out of past life trauma, then you are no longer so triggered in this life by whatever else has happened. It can really sort of accelerate healing or stop you reacting in a certain way. You're no longer triggered by an event because it's, if you process work through past life, which is usually just by discovering it and then being able, the soul being able to let it go. Um, you can do it through regression or when I'm working with people, I just tell them what happened and this, you just see the, shifts happening you know usually very quickly so we have these traumas that, that happen in past lives so um uh let me let me give you a, an example a very common one would be that you have a past life of imprisonment or enslavement and it could be you know literal or it could be the bird in the gilded cage you know maybe in a marriage where you have no freedom or Something, something has interfered with your ability to really be autonomous and to have the freedom that your soul would like. 
So let's say you were a prisoner in a past life. What that creates is a, um, a past life fear of powerlessness because you were completely disempowered. You've got no, um, no autonomy, no say over your destiny. Somebody's telling you when to get up, when to uh, poop, when to eat. You, know, you have no freedom whatsoever. So a couple of things will happen um, in this life. You know, some of the typical signs of somebody who's been totally disempowered in the previous lifetime. The most common sign is uh, summed up in the phrase, don't tell me what to do. Because if a, if a person is reminded, if, if you tell somebody what to do rather than asking them, they, their soul can easily be taken back. For, for, it goes back for reference all the time to past lives. So it finds that past life of imprisonment. And goes well first of all it reacts don't tell me what to do because that's what you had what was a major feature of that that life but the risk is that you can also go into a place of um almost like uh, victimization or passivity uh, it can be very hard when you've had that level of powerlessness to see all your options yeah, it's one of these things that feels like the blinders on you know it's kind of like you 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 I often when I'm working with somebody who's had that sort of experience, I'll say to them, well, uh, have you thought about this solution? And they go, oh, no, <laughs> I haven't thought about that. It's like not all the options are, are, are seen. They're, they're, they're not available. It's just an effect of that thing. Now, so what that person can easily do is go into a place of disempowerment. Let's say there's a traumatic thing they just feel like oh i don't know how to deal with this and and so on when you get somebody who's damaged this could be a younger soul or um it could be somebody who's caught behind the illusion as the spirit guides would say it's like they're 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 not spiritually connected um, basically they're lacking empathy it's like you know that would be the sort of i think the the one sign you see always a narcissist the, you know the absence of empathy and um, what you'll get if, let's say they have the same fear. So they've been imprisoned as well. They come into the, 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 this dynamic with you. You have a tendency to go into that sort of powerless place to be disempowered. You're internalizing what's, what's happened in the, the, the past life. But the, uh, the younger soul or the, the person whose empathy is blocked um, they will externalize. And what that means is that then they will, they've been controlled, so now they are going to control you. Now you as the old soul empath would go, gosh, I never want to control anybody because personal freedom, you know, imagine after being imprisoned, personal freedom is going to be a major thing for your soul. And, uh, and because of karma and empathy and so on, you, you want to give other people as much freedom as possible because that's what you would want for yourself. But the person who's damaged on that sort of level will actually try to make themselves feel better uh, by controlling somebody else. And that's why control is such a common feature uh, in, you know, with, with narcissists, sociopaths, bullies in, in, in general. Uh, so they're, uh, they're imposing something on you that you as an empath would never dream of doing. I mean, you wouldn't control somebody. It would be, you, you, you know, it's just wrong, you know, and, uh, uh, but, but they, it, it boosts them. They, they, you know, why not? They, you know, they can do that. So that's an unfortunate dynamic where both are working through the same fear, the, the same past life issue, but, but it's manifesting in very, very different ways. Yeah. And that, could, that applies to all the fears. All the past life fears can be categorized. And there's 10 fears. And then there's 10 phobias, which are death-related fears. But, you know, every fear, whatever it is that's going on with you, is, is, it will fit into one of those categories, which makes it, you know, easy to identify. It also means when you look at a past life, you can immediately tell what sort of thing is going to be up for that person. If you were abandoned by your mother in a past life, you're going to have rejection the fear of rejection and abandonment issues in this life. It's just, you know, these things are kind of inevitable. Um, if you lost everyone you loved in a past life, you're going to have issues around loss. So uh, generally how these, these fears will, will show up, like I say, in the empath, is much more sort of like, uh, you know, internalized. Judgment would be, a, it would be a really good 
example of that. That's actually a phobia, death-related fear. And it comes from such things as being judged and executed in a past life, maybe judged for, you know, in a court of law. It could be judged for the color of your skin, for your religion or something. So uh, it's, it's usually judgment followed by death. So it could be execution or, you know, caught up in a massacre, pogrom, genocide, something something of that nature. It's surprisingly common, unfortunately. And, okay, so the fear of judgment would show up normally in, in, in empathic or just you know, normal old soul. It would show up as a uh, fear of public speaking. You know, you're, you're in front of an audience and then, oh my God, you know, I'm being judged again and I'm going to die. And so not surprisingly, you get the fight or flight kind of thing. Um, it's very strong adrenal reaction you know because it's and it's totally out out of proportion you know you may just be giving a speech at a wedding or something and internally you're kind of you're you're dying you know it's like it's the most terrifying thing you've ever faced i mean i had to go i had to work through this one i mean i i as i put in my new book i had conversation with with a friend once before i'd worked through the fear it was like would you rather lose a finger than give a speech and then we have this earnest conversation about, well, which finger, how much of a finger would it be? Just be that, the top bit or whatever, you know, because <laughs> we'd much rather do anything. I'd rather have lost my head than, you know, give a speech until I worked through the, the, the past life fear. So you have that as, a, as an empath, you've got the fear of public speaking, could be a heightened concern about how people perceive you, uh, could be stage fright, um, test anxiety, that sort of thing. Anything that's associated with judgment. Completely related. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, you know I've talked about this before. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, and unfortunately it's quite a quite a common one, like I say. So if you get then the, the bully coming into a relationship with you or it could be a parent or or whatever, their judgment is going to be um, again, it'll be imposed on you, it's externalized. And so they will be become hyper critical of you you know if you've ever been with a partner who's super critical they're picking up on every little thing you do wrong um, nothing's good enough uh, those little put downs um, that's judgment and you know and again it's, it can be one of those things that in somebody who's kind of dysfunctional like that it makes them feel better about themselves I mean, it's, it's appalling that, that happens, but that's, that's how it works. That's, um, you know, so it's, it's not like, it's not like the, the dysfunctional person goes, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. It's like, no, why not? You know, I can, you know, I can, and they'll find the, the weak spot. And this is why, you know, when you get these shared, uh, shared fears, you know, like once bo or both have that fear of, of judgment but it's expressed very differently, you know, like coming in. And so the, the, the narcissist or the bully goes, hmm, I can, I, oh, I, you know, I can detect that. Not consciously, but they know what to, what to play on. So, you know, let's say their fear is inferiority, self-worth issues from a past life of being treated as if you had no value. So again, the old soul is working through with all this internalized stuff, the self-worth issues, am I good enough? And the the bully comes along, they don't feel good about themselves, but little fleas have little fleas. And so they will then, they'll, they'll bully you, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll diminish you. They'll, uh, they'll make you feel lesser because it makes them feel better about themselves. I mean, again, it's totally dysfunctional, but, but they, they will know which it's, it's almost like a precision guidance, you know, that, uh, the bully and none and were very little bit conscious, but they know what buttons to push. They know what's going to do the maximum damage. And that's why, of course, you know, coming out of a, a, a narcissistic relationship, when you, you know, you can have damage that, you know, takes years to recover from. I mean, the great thing though is it is you can recover from it. And, uh, one of the ways actually is to heal your past life fears so that you, you are no longer triggered and certainly uh, work on boundaries as well. I think also, and if I could just mention this, because I think it's really important. A lot of people don't know when they're being abused. They don't know 
that it's it's not normal it and normal so kind of learning about these things like you know um i mean i wish somebody had taken me aside when i was 15 years old and said here there's this thing called narcissistic abuse now i want to you know make you aware of this uh well what a different you know real life it, it, it would have been because i would have been uh, I would I would have known what was happening, but I I read a fantastic quote. It was just a, somebody writing a comment on YouTube um, to a, a video about narcissism, and if I can remember, it's, it's called something close to this. It's that you know, you know that you've been in in a narcissist in a narcissistic relationship if afterwards you you could practically get a PhD in psychology from all the work that you do trying to understand what that person did to you. I'm sure that a lot of people would recognize that. You know, it's like, why does it go so deep? Why do you get fixated on things? Why are you still going, you know, years later, go, why, why would they do that? You know, or, or, or it can be also be, you know, for the, the empath. Oh, you know, why did I let myself be treated that way? You know, you beat yourself up again if you've got judgment going on there, and that's been hugely triggered by somebody who's, you know, prodded that all the time. Then, of course, you're, you're going to judge yourself. Oh, gosh, I'm flawed. That's why. That's one of the reasons empaths will double down if uh, if a narcissist or a bully withdraws love, which is a a way of controlling. It's actually if they've got a fear around, well. I, I think it's almost a defining feature, I think, of narcissists is, uh, is uh, avoiding int intimacy, usually past life fear of, of intimacy. And, um, but what the empath will do is go, okay, you know, oh, right, so um, they're pushing me away or they're using sex as a weapon or whatever. And instead of going, well, screw this, I'm out of here or whatever, the empath's first thing is, Boy, how can, how can I fix myself? Or how can I, what, what can I do to, maybe I need to be more loving. Maybe I need to do this. And maybe I need to be more supportive. You know, yeah. uh, it's yeah. always that sort of, you know, going internally and saying, it must be me. <laughs> yeah, so, what can I do to make this relationship better? Right. Over and over again. Yeah. Great. So looking at it from a young soul and an old soul perspective, how with the narcissist and the empath or a person on, a, on the spectrum and then a person going into that relationship, how do you see the young soul and old soul dynamic playing into that? Well, it, you can get a, I mean, I, I see the dynamic of, you know, I, I mean, just briefly, you know, you, you become an old soul, <clears throat> obviously just because you've reincarnated many, many more times than a younger soul. Mm -hmm. But there is one, I mean, this is actually a defining factor when it comes to how do you tell the difference between a young and an old soul. At the point where you go from being a young soul to an old soul, roughly, say, halfway through all your many lifetimes, you, you go from a, this more external focus to having one that's much more introspective. And that's really the sort of, you know, usually the difference. You'll see younger souls... Um, Younger souls, I mean, a lot of them will, will rise to positions of prominence in government. I, mean, I write about this. It's very unfortunate. But, you know, many of our elected leaders, the younger soul ones, who tend to be the ones who are a little more conservative, you don't picture them at night worrying, oh, my God, did I do the right thing? You know, there's not that same level of introspection that you would get with an older soul who, who might be really worrying about, the effect of their actions and how is it affecting other people and so on. Uh, so, but you do get this dynamic happening where you get older souls coming into a relationship with a younger soul. The very typical one, this is one that I see a lot in my work, is where, because I'll be working with the old soul. I mean, and no, no young soul has yet to call me up for, for a session. Um, you know, they just don't do this kind of thing. So I'm working with the old soul, usually women. Most of my clients are women. So she's like a, an old soul. She's on the spiritual path. She's wanting to learn and grow, do her healing work, go to her, you know, weekend retreats, uh, her yoga class, uh, the meditation stuff. It's all that so spiritual uh, stuff. Um, and she's with a guy who's, who's he's a younger soul 
and he's got that uh, hunter or leader energy, very sort of more masculine energy. And what the agreement is often between these souls is that uh, the younger soul is saying, look, I am programmed to be a provider. You know, like I'm a hunter, it's what I do. You know, I'll go out and I'll work. I won't complain. I'll, I'll, you know, there'll be food on the table. We'll make sure we have a nice home and, and you know, take care of the bills. Mm -hmm. And then that gives you the freedom as the old soul spiritualist type to go out and explore uh, your spirituality, not have to focus on survival issues like you've done in so many lifetimes. So this is actually an agreement set up by souls before uh, coming here. And, you know, it works. It works pretty well up to a point. So usually the person I'm talking to, yeah, she doesn't have to, uh, she doesn't have to have a day job. She's, you know, she gets to read her spiritual stuff and he's not particularly drawn to it. He's, mm -hmm. but he doesn't understand it. But yeah. You know, there is this soul level agreement, even if he doesn't know it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so very, very typically I find, yeah, that's worked for a while. But then I get the, this thing happening where they've been together for 20 years and she's tearing her hair out and coming to me saying, I'm going crazy because I don't get the intimacy I want with my, my husband. And you go, you look at the, the dynamic and you say, mm, okay, well, you're, you're a level 10 soul. He's a level five soul. He does not gonna, he's not able to see the world the way that you do. He hasn't developed that, that introspection, some of the things that really allow a person to get to that deeper, intimate place. There might even be a big fear of intimacy and you know, wanting to avoid that. And so the, the older soul is going, yeah, I, can't, I can't live without more intimacy. You know, it's, um, you know I love him, but he, he, he can't talk about emotions or whatever it is. And that's kind of like, yeah, well, that was the trade-off. You know, that was what, it seemed to be a good idea at the time, and maybe that's fine, or maybe the relationship has run its course. But, but it's, often you don't get, that would be the biggest problem I'd see, that you have the old soul with a younger soul. They don't really see the world the same way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be a little bit, a bit of a mentor-student kind of relationship. Um, but, uh, you know, it can work, I think is, you know, what I'd say, but usually there's a there's such a difference in perspective that it, it doesn't really necessarily go anywhere unless there is a, a you know this pre-existing agreement let's try and you know work out this dynamic where you know you let me explore and i'll you know and i'll help mentor you or give you the freedom you want or something uh so it and sometimes it, it doesn't work out long term sometimes it works out short term sometimes in fact i i've got some good friends who have this dynamic um, and you know they're they've been doing it for decades I mean you know married to I don't know 40 50 years or something and and it works really well but you you do see them going off you know very much doing their separate things so it's like yeah well what you know what is most important to you so you know some people uh, you know they're all here about achieving intimacy i mean I can, for a lot of old souls that is the the goal and if you're going to do that it's probably going to be a lot easier to do it with somebody who's part of your soul family who you've known before in previous lifetimes mm -hmm. and who has a deeper degree of empathy and ability to sort of really connect on that level well that's the problem for a lot of old souls in a relationship with, either with a narcissist or um, somebody who's blocked um, maybe in the, in the area of empathy it's like the, they're they're craving something that uh, they want pillow talk you know the ability to be able to share something with 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 their loved one and uh, be understood or be heard and uh, that's not so easy you know sometimes the the younger soul just doesn't have the vocabulary or the understanding of a life experience to be able to really make any sense of it you know why are you talking like this because oh, this, i don't get it you know um if that person were a narcissist or, or, or a bully, um, they could end up using that against you very typically because the, the narcissist will be trying to avoid intimacy. So they can do it by lobbing little hand grenades into the relationship, yeah. especially in the area of intimacy. I'm sure you know, you know, I almost picture it like taking that grenade and 
pulling out the pain and there you go you know create starting an argument before love making would be you know an example mm-hmm. or um sharing something that you said in where you assume there's confidence you know the pillow talk and you know the next thing it's being shared with a bunch of people um and you quickly learn as an old soul to shut down maybe it takes you a little bit longer because you're an empath and you're you keep trying to work through it and you know there is that empath thing of like well this time this time's going to be different right um, it isn't always but that's part of the that idealism but the um but the but the, nar- the narcissist will tend to sort of uh sabotage that sort of whole area so that they don't have to deal with you know that going deeper yeah or thing. at the same time sabotaging and expecting you to still be intimate with them and craving your intimacy but sabotaging it yeah time. yeah and, it's, and, and that you know comes down to sort of you, you know using sex as a weapon um and certainly you know lacking that the lack of empathy means that, that yeah really what it's about is their needs and not really about yours right so these days we're seeing it kind of on a broader scale yeah. in the world so <laughs> when it comes to that emotional maturity piece and perspectives so how are we seeing you know from the guy's perspective political social and religious views these days because we're really bumping into all of those yeah well everything everything looks quite polarized and uh what we're going through right now um kind of globally is a, a major shift in in consciousness and that's um well this is the transformation that i yes. i've written about and talked about and this is something that where it's it's uh it's old souls old souls like well empathic spiritually oriented old souls kind of leading the charge you know the healers the the podcasters the you know people are trying to make a difference in this world are are pushing stuff pushing things and, and boundaries of knowledge and all that sort of thing and especially in a spiritual sort of context pushing that out there um and that's actually part of this is just you know that's as your your consciousness is is go, uh, going through some very rapid uh accelerated growth it's also it gives a lot of people the need to, to help others you want to you you're you're making these amazing connections and realizations and you want to share it with the world you know it's that's uh again sort of empathic karmic kind of thing you know it's not just about you it's about other uh, other people mm-hmm. so we have some major changes going on uh the, the shift in consciousness it's the the biggest one we've had in 55,000 years the the previous one was what really allowed us as human beings to to become the Uh, creatures of reason and creativity that we are now this one is taking things to it, helping us to to get to another level um and also it's a, a little bit of it's because of the risk of destroying the world you know it's like this is so spirit guides will often say to me the world is never meant to be this way and it won't always be mm-hmm. um you know we're run by wall street or whatever it's just it was never meant to be that it's just, just all these are just you know artificial uh creations and they don't really benefit most of us so uh there there are changes of food but the younger souls or or those who are caught up behind the illusion are not very uh, comfortable with this i mean they don't know what to make of it um so you're getting an awful lot of resistance there so you get the alt- more altruistic old soul if you think of the journey that your soul takes from life number 1 to to life whatever it is when you end um it's taking you from fear to love and so you get that greater altruism as you get to be right up at the end of this spectrum as it were you know when you get to be a really old soul and this is where you know with the with all that's been happening recently with black lives matter people out on the street you'll see that it's not just it's not just black people out there advocating for themselves you're getting people of all colors and uh ages and so on I mean you get the 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 grannies out there and yeah. kids and and everything and it's very very encouraging because it's a sign that uh, you know it's it, people are not just doing it for themselves they're doing it because it's the right thing to do yeah. and it's because in em, em, empathy 
allows you to put your put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And uh, also, as you get an older, to be an older soul, when somebody else is suffering, you've been there at some point in one of your many lifetimes, or maybe many of your lifetimes, you've been persecuted, you've been treated as lesser because of your skin color or something like that. So a lot of old souls can be doing a lot of internal healing, healing their own stuff by helping, helping other people. And so th- this is very confusing for for younger souls who see huge differences between things like just simply gender, you know, or um, I don't know, they're freaked out by the whole trans thing, um, or you know, just feel like you know women should know their place or something like that. They don't see the equality, um, you know, big differences in skin color, you know, who you make love with, you know, your, your sexual orientation and so on, and so um, they then tend to then you know was it like double down on whatever it is like you know the homophobia or the racism they're trying to hold on to something that they they understand it's simple it's black and white you know us good them bad that's one of the things about an old soul you see everything so much more in shades of gray so so we're getting this um big reaction right now older souls coming out speaking out uh, and getting you know, getting their thoughts out, out there into the world. You know, even, you know, Oprah, for example, you know, is, is really, um, whatever you think of Oprah, and I happen to think she's, she's marvelous, but um, she's really opened people's eyes to, you know, a more spiritual world. A lot of people wouldn't have been exposed to that um, otherwise. Mm-hmm. More and more people, it's becoming more and more mainstream. Unfortunately, the more that happens, the more you'll get that resistance. And we'll get over this eventually, and you know the world will be a better place for it. But right now we're in the chaos place. You know, it's like, um, you know, you'll, you'll see it with young souls in power all the time. Whenever there's a sort of uprising, things they don't understand. Um, you know, it, there's never an attempt to sort of reach across the aisle or figure out, well, let's how how can we fix your problem? It's just send in the troops. You know. So, shoot off some tear gas it's um that's the that's the sort of young soul way they don't understand there's not an attempt to to understand that would be that would require uh you know quite and it's not to say young souls don't have the empathy but it would require a lot more empathy than it's usually there and it, absolutely i should stress that there's nothing wrong with being a, a young soul like the same way there's nothing wrong with being a seven-year-old it's yeah. just a different perspective on life and not every young soul is lacking in empathy, but they just sometimes do um, have a difficulty relating to people of, it can be different skin color, different cultures, different religions, and so on. And usually with the sense that theirs, whatever it is, is the right one. Their God's the only God. Uh, their skin color is the best skin color, you know, whatever. So, so what do your um, guides say about moving out of those limiting beliefs or negative belief systems? You know, that we're facing right now you know they're really they're, blocking a lot of areas in our lives right now yeah well I, I, they see that you know as, as we get through this sort of you know turbulence it's it's good there's going to be greater plain sailing unfortunately that could be sometime in the future and you know whether we we will experience that in our lifetimes or not i don't know but, it, but it's likely to take uh, quite some time but they they've generally felt very optimistic i mean because you know, I'm just human. I, I, I have conversations with my spirit guides where I go, geez, guides, you know, are we going to hell in a handbasket? Is, you know, what the hell is the point? And they go, no, you know, this is, um, I mean, it should never have been this way, like I said before. You know, we should never be, uh, I mean, there's been so, so much corruption out there in so many different ways. Um, you know, our institutions are corrupt. You know, I mean, we, we're, we're in a system that is fundamentally racist, for example. I mean, systemic. Um, we, we have, you know, this terrible inequality, you know, this huge gulf between rich and poor. You know, I mean, you've got Bezos with, you know, billions every day he seems to be earning and, and people being evicted from their homes. And that sort of thing is, you know, in an old soul kind of world, you know, where we're, we're recognizing the humanity in each other shouldn't happen 
shouldn't happen at all. I mean, this, you know, there really is no reason for there to be, um, for the world to be, like I say, like the world to be the way it is, but for there to be such a level of inequality, for there to be homelessness. I mean, you look at America, I mean, it's sort of one of the wealthiest countries ever in history. And, and yet so many people on the streets, so many people like, you know, one paycheck away from homelessness, uh, food insecurity, you know, everywhere. I mean, it's utter, utterly appalling. And it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, if there was a political will, unfortunately, what you get is, is so many people rising to positions of authority. It goes back to the, the narcissist thing, because so many of the, the people who are driven to control others are going to be narcissists. And so many of the people that you'll see in the highest positions in Washington or anywhere else are going to be narcissistic. They're in it, uh, you know, apart for ego. Um, they, they might pretend that, it, you know, they're, they're just there to help people or whatever, but it's not. It's about, you know, it's, it's about ego and money and power and, and so on. I mean, you have uh, the Trumps and the Connells and, and so many of that ilk who have really no right to be in the places that they are. Because, I mean, what's the purpose of government? It's not just to, you know, enrich yourselves or, or just help your own, your own team, your own, you know, supporters. Um, so the, the, we need to get, get back to a, a world where we are not uh, placing all this value on, on um, you know, that rung, rugged individualist thing, which is just nonsense. Um, because, uh, you know, everyone's reliant on everyone else. We need to get more of that recognition. Um, and, you know, whatever you call it, we need, you know, whether it's more, you know, socialism or whatever, you know, it is, we need a fairer world. I mean, like, I mean, capitalism and, and the whole system we're in is clearly not working. I mean, it's working for people uh, who are fortunate, who are at the top. Um, it is not working for the, the, the majority of people. And uh, there are other, other ways of being. And uh, that will be, I think, as we work through this, you know, you'll see even it happening now. The transformation is happening as, as we're speaking. Mm -hmm. And you'll get these more um, progressive, empathic, older souls coming into positions of power, you know, like the 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 squad that in Washington right now, you know, these uh, incredible women, you know, AOC and, and others, they are, oh my God, you know, where have they been? But, you know, finally, yeah. it's a time for, you know, to go back to this. But you'll see such resistance from the, the, the younger souls particularly who, who are, you know, I mean, they're horrified by this. What you, you want, you want, Free healthcare for everybody? Ridiculous communist plot. You know, it's kind of like every other, you know, industrialist industrialized society seems to have it. They've figured out how to make it work, you know. So I'm going to get off my soapbox in a moment, but that's really kind of um, uh, it's the theme of the day, isn't it? I mean, it's really about you know narcissists, and unfortunately, they, you know, they they do seize the the reins, you know, and then. It's not, it's not always going to be to, to everyone's benefit. If we have more empathic people in positions of power, then they're going to be much more uh, concerned about, you know, fairer deal for, for everybody. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason why we should have hunger, we should have homelessness and so on. I mean, it's, just, it's political will rather than anything else. It's not because we can't afford it. I mean, Jeff Bezos could put an end to homelessness tomorrow. It's like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think the more people we can get in power, the better off we'll be for sure. And I'm hoping, you know, as the generations come up and people start stepping forward, that that's going to be the case, and especially yeah. with everything that's going on right now. Yeah. Well, okay. it is for, you know, so there's always a sort of uh, action and reaction. And uh, yeah, we're certainly seeing, we're seeing a lot of reactions going on now. Um, but a lot of older souls just, you know, just fed up with the way that it's, it's been. And uh, recognizing, you know, just how how messed up uh, the system is. 
Yes, and I'm so glad that everything is being brought out into the light right now so we can make the necessary yeah. changes that need to be made. Yeah, it's nothing new. It's just more visible. Yes. Mm. And thank you to those who have made it so visible. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right? Yeah. You said something in your book. The key to personal healing is to empower others. Mm. Let's talk about that a little bit and also empowering ourselves as we move forward you know, with everything yeah. going on today. Well, again, this would go back to past lives where you've been disempowered. And of course, if you look at, at the world, the way it's been, if you know anything about history, you'll know most of the lifetimes you've had, you were probably not in a position of power. Uh, you were probably fairly downtrodden. And there will be those past lives of enslavement, imprisonment that I talked about. Uh, and so... A lot of old souls right now are are working on becoming empowered. If you if you if you scan your life and you see that your journey has anything to do with coming from a place of disempowerment to learning to really stand up for your rights or to um, set boundaries or whatever that sort of thing might be, this is you learning to be an empowered person, and it's actually what we should all be doing. But it becomes the it it picks up speed as you get to be an older soul anyway, it becomes more, more vital. But there's a thing called um, karma, and karma is about um, always creating balance. And so if, if you've been uh, disempowered in a past life in any way, and you, then in this life you're going to learn to be an empowered person. So it's a major journey for so many of the people that I, I work with. Mm-hmm. But it's karmic. Um, that something has to be balanced. And the most common way to do that is if you think of the, the karmic pendulum, it, also ha- it, it will swing, but it, you, usually there's a bit of a kind of like an over uh, correction. You know, what was where I was saying if somebody's being disempowered, they'll tend to have that sort of don't tell me what to do um, reaction. And it's a little bit of a sometimes an over, over uh, correction. But along with this, it's something uh, as a way to balance the karma is uh, spiritual acts. Spiritual acts are those things that you do where you heal yourself by helping those who suffer as you've done, whether it's in this life or in a previous lifetime. So if you're working through learning to, to be an empowered person, you're going to want to empower others. And I see this as a, as a major feature of a lot of healers and coaches and people like that that I work with, that you can almost tell what the theme is going to be. If, well, in fact, it's very, very common. Whatever you're working through is probably what you want, in part, what you want to help other people with. One interesting aspect of this, though, is, again, is a spiritual act. Always think of it as healing yourself by helping those who suffer as you once did. And I've noticed that working or being being interviewed a lot, especially since my last book came out. I'm talking to all these podcasters. I'm doing little readings. Um, and then I, I realized that every single one was working through a past life fear of rejection. Mm. And it's by having a podcast that you're healing your rejection because you're, um, the effects of rejection, this comes from abandonment in a past life or dying alone, uh, on a battlefield, it's a very typical thing where you feel just let down by humanity, uh, God or, or people or whatever. And so you're dying alone or maybe you've been an orphan, there's no mother there f- for you. So it creates this fear of rejection. Shows up in this life, it's a tendency feel, to feel like a bit of an outsider or like you don't fully fit in. But your soul will want you to belong, but it will also hold the fear. Um, so you gotta push and pull. Like I want to, I want to belong, but then I'm a bit afraid that if I do, I'll get rejected again. Mm-hmm. Um, so by being this kind of um, Pied Piper almost, you know, podcast Pied Piper, you draw people in. And the people that you draw in will be people kind of like yourself. They will be empathic, uh, older souls maybe older souls who are interested in healing or whatever it is that you're interested in. And if you're all about empowerment, you'll get people coming to you who need to, to be empowered. If you're wanting to, if you're dealing, working through your past life fear of rejection, then what you're giving is these people 
is a place to belong. They can come and be with kindred spirits, probably even by soul agreement. Fascinating stuff. Yeah, really fascinating. Yeah. Thanks. You also uh, mentioned something in your book, which I really like. Create a ripple effect through acts of kindness. Can you share the exercise that you suggested in the book with everybody? Absolutely. Great. Who if I could remember what it, did, <laughs> what it <laughs> is. What page are we on? Right. It was, um, I could find it. It was having people write down things that they could do to create a kindness ripple. Oh, okay. All right. Um, absolutely. Well, the ripple effect thing, this, um, a lot of old souls have something called a d desire for immortality. It's actually a formal part of their, their life plan. And the, the, it's, I always stress that it's not about living forever, you know, especially older souls go, Oh God, I don't want to be here forever. You know, it's like, <laughs> what have you done? Um, but it's, it's really about leaving a legacy or creating that ripple effect. And those little acts of kindness, little things that, that you do, um, they go so far towards healing karma and creating new good karma, as it were, like sending out good stuff, good vibes into the, into the world. So finding little, you know, doing little acts of kindness can be, you know, really can touch people's lives. I mean, if you think of it, if you look back on times in this life where maybe somebody just did something little for you, they didn't have to do it, but they just helped you a little bit along the way. And it doesn't have to be much. I mean, I, I, I had a, a old woman one time in a supermarket in, in, in the UK and she was one penny short on her groceries and the checkout person didn't know what to do. And I just went over and here's a penny. And she's so grateful. Couldn't believe that's only a penny. Um, but there's something there, but you know, for, for that person, oh, that's a big deal. You know, it's nothing. No skin off you know, for so many of us, we can do so much uh, to to help other people. Uh, every um, February, we have um, was it uh, National Random Acts of Kindness Day, um, which which is wonderful. I I I I, I don't I, I don't celebrate that one regularly, but I've done it f f several years where I I just loaded up with some bouquets of flowers and boxes of cookies and just gone and handed them out sometimes to strangers and uh, just, you know, it's just a way of making your day. And it's a little easier to do it because I mean, sometimes you can do it self-conscious about these things, but if it's, if you can say, well, Hey, it's random acts of kindness day, here's your flowers. Right. Um, it's a, it's a bit easier. But yeah, it's really fine ways that you can, those little acts of kindness, little things that you can do. It can be giving somebody a call or just, um, you know, thinking about, you know, conversation you know, with somebody, oh, and, you know, maybe I could buy them a book on that thing we were talking about. Those little things help to make people feel valued and they help you to feel good. There, there's a reason why we feel good when we, when we help somebody, because when the soul feels good, it's the soul can't separate mind, body, and spirit. It sees this whole bun, bundle. So when you do something altruistic, and it doesn't have to be big things, you don't have to be Mother Teresa, is what my spirit guides always say. Um, then soul feels good. Yeah, we did something nice there, and that floods through into the conscious mind and into the body as well. You can even feel physically better for 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 doing it, and it can be just little things like opening a door for somebody it doesn't have to it really doesn't have to be huge um because people often think oh my gosh you know what do i have to do you know do i have to become a martyr of some kind <laughs> no just just think about little little things you can do every little ripple helps for sure. every, every little bit yeah and what you send out you know you have no idea you will not know how much difference you've made to the world until you process this life when you're done with it you go to the astral plane and then you sort of are aware of the what the, what the ripple effect is about is, is that you do things and you have no idea um you know you, can, you can't be aware of the emotions that you've created in somebody else and maybe how that affected them um yeah you give somebody a bunch of flowers they feel good and maybe they're a little kinder to their child who's acting out that night or 
something like that. There's little ripple effects. Of course, you could never be aware on this plane. But when you go and process this life, you do become aware of all, all of that. And it heals you and it helps to create good karma for the, for the future. Like I always say about these acts of kindness, uh, you know, the, the spiritual acts, everybody manifests. You heal yourself and you help other people. Nice. Yeah. We're coming to the end of our interview, Ainsley. Is there anything uh, you'd like to leave our listeners with today? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, th th yeah, there is. Um, I just want to say that, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of old souls, especially when we've got this crazy world that we're, we're living in, you know, at the, at the time that we're recording this, uh, you know, there's attempts to basically destroy the post office. There's all these things that are up and, you know, in, in people's awareness right now. And a lot of people come to me, you know, the, these sensitive empathic older souls feeling just overwhelmed by what's going on and they 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 talk about you know i just want to i want to go to the other side or i don't want to have to be involved with this i don't watch the news anymore and that's fine that's a choice but you know if you detach well somewhere there's somebody who who's suffering who might not be suffering if you were actually involved in some way and doing doing something and uh you know we don't all have to take to the streets or anything but we should all be aware of the importance of being on the right side of history and um, supporting organizations that help other people. And I will say, like, you know, people come to me and they feel overwhelmed. Well, turn those, turn those emotions that you're, you're turning inside and maybe it's eating you up or whatever. Put it out and make a difference in the world. You know, do something to support a, a charity, join the ACLU, you know, do something that makes makes you part of the the solution and there's so much surprisingly so much we can do yeah right on this platform on zoom yeah. or other platforms getting involved with organizations well, yes doing zoom meetings and you know getting things out and social media and yeah right yeah use social media absolutely and uh you know yeah be be a part of the solution yes i like that be a part of the solution thanks Ainsley. it was a Great to have you as usual. Oh, well, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And I, and I know we'll do it again sometime soon, but um, That'd be great. thank you so much for, for having me on the show. Thanks, Ainsley. And thank you for joining me, everybody. Once again, this is Raise the Vibe with Liz, and I'm your host, Liz Peterson. And remember to get out there and raise the vibe. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.